Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not introducing everybody. It, people can see the names. We're just teachers talking about. So, so that's the context is we want to approach if, if, if I'm not saying that too hypothetically, because Ryan is preparing to teach this, right? If you're looking at a block of come yeah. follow me, how, what are, what are some approaches to the block that would be helpful to a teacher to understand? That's, that's kind of the idea. So let's talk wisdom literature. Yeah, you're presuming that I've looked that far ahead. Have, have you not, have you not looked ahead yet? I've, I've gotten, I've gotten the high level kind of scratching. I haven't read, read any of it because geez, there's 150 Psalms. I mean, yeah, you, you're, you got to finish that up. <laughs> so, all right. So, um, so give us, give us a bird's eye view then. What have you looked at? So one of the, and one of the things that I studied, what I really liked about wisdom literature is this idea that we're talking probabilities, not guarantees. So like Proverbs is a bunch of cat posters. <laughs> right? <laughs> there's going to be all these, there's going to be these sayings that have high probability that if you do this, the probability is like raise up your child in the Lord and then they'll never go astray, right? There's yeah. high probability but anyone that's lived the messiness of, of mortality knows that there's no guarantees. Yeah, yeah. Which is, so Proverbs starts with the cat posters of high probability. And then Ecclesiastes follows into this. Uh, have, have you have you looked at that word, Havel? Yeah, Havel, yeah. Havel, Havel. The, the, it's nothingness, meaningless, meaning, meaning. It's, it's like smoke. Yeah, right? you see smoke and it looks beautiful and, and you feel like there might be something there until you try to grab it. Yeah. Ben Spackman it's, likened Ecclesiastes, the, the, the preacher of Ecclesiastes to a cynical old man who's just who's just telling the next generation, <laughs> you know, the truth behind life. So we take this cat poster from Proverbs and then we put we try to put it in the reality of of complicated, messy life and there's not ever resolution. It's just, you need to be prepared that the only, the only thing that is certain time moves on yeah. and we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's wisdom literature. And, that's wisdom, <laughs> and right? actually, and actually you got to throw Job in there. Job is the and other, Job is a part of that. Yeah. Is, is part of that wisdom. He, he's the case study, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I find it interesting that in wisdom literature, um, it's it doesn't purport to be prophetic. It, it does not have that air of authority um, more than a parent would have the authority to be giving advice to their child, which is often how Proverbs is even phrased is um, I'm a parent and I'm giving you advice as a child. Uh, well, and what and what what uh, qualifies a parent to give that advice? Well, experience, and that's that's, that's the what, only thing, right? Is right. I have lived a little bit longer than you have, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I've experienced these things, and here are some of the lessons that I learned. So, okay, so if that's uh, so, if we look at the week, you have a week with Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, right? Um, there is a doctrinal mastery verse in Proverbs 3, right? Um, so really what it comes down to is you have a day or two of, of doctrinal mastery, and then you have maybe maybe two to three days for Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So how, how would you, uh, how would you go about it? Well, I, I, it's interesting because I feel like what we've got in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is what we purport we're doing with all other scripture. I was just reading this from Ben Spackman this morning, where he's like, we, we claim that scripture is supposed to help us in the day-to-day -day life. But if you look at what's actually happening in most scripture is we're getting a lot of examples of what not to do. Like there, there aren't a lot of really good examples of how to live the gospel daily. Well, Proverbs is, a, is the book that's giving you the advice on how to live a good life daily. And so um, it kind of gives it's funny. 
because we we often think of scripture mistakenly as if it's some type of handbook for right. life, right? Like a like a user's manual, uh, and it's not. Most scripture is not. Proverbs actually is is that. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, I can imagine a teacher though coming across Job and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and being like, "What are these things that I that I have to teach?" Because it's not. It doesn't feel like scripture, like we normally think of scripture, right? Um, but when, I think one of the things that makes that the case is that they all kind of disagree with each other a little bit. Yeah, there's it's there's contradiction good. between, even yeah. between Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Yeah. In the well, even within verses in Ecclesiastes, right. there's, con there's, there's contradiction. And, yeah. and it's not, it's not the case that it's like, you know, Ecclesiastes <laughs> is saying Proverbs is all wrong. Uh, but they're coming at it from these different perspectives and scripture does that all the time. We're just not used to reading it that way or teaching right. it that way. Or even being aware that that's what it's doing. Right. So if we're going to approach like as a teacher, if I'm approaching this book and being like, okay, where's the consistent message? That's probably not the question to ask going in. Right. The, the question to ask is probably what's the perspective of this book? And what's the perspective of this book? And how do I use both of those to be relevant to students, right? Because look, if, if you go into a classroom and you're giving aphorism after aphorism to your students, they might nod along with you and maybe one of them is going to make it through right? and be like, oh yeah, that's a really, you know, I'm going to like tweet that or whatever, I don't know, you know, but but if if you're using on the one hand, Proverbs, look, there are some wise ways to approach life. And on the other hand, the reality, the harsh reality of Ecclesiastes, you can you can point students to Christ that way. Students can feel seen. They want to do what's right, but life is messy. Right. Right. Right in there is a really good tension, I think, to get yeah. at what people are experiencing in their in their daily lives and how did that point to Christ. I feel like the I feel like the relevance, um, especially for teenagers, is they tend to always want to focus on the exceptions to the rule. Yeah. They feel like they're an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna see the relevance, but what we gotta try to help them see is exceptions are exceptions because the rule is generally what is what happens right book of mormon if you keep my commandments you shall prosper in the land statement of truth largely but then the book of mormon then goes through and tells us all these stories where good people were afflicted and enemies attacked them and dissidents tried to change whatever right and and so maybe 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 a point of this is try to understand what is the difference. What are we talking? Are we talking about temporal types of blessings? Are we talking eternal? Like how do we how do we help students to expand their their perspective to a uh, an eternal perspective? That yeah, when it says do this and this will happen, eternal perspective says yeah, big picture that eventually will happen. But until then. We're going to have this roller coaster of stuff that's going to go on that it might it may not look like what we expect it to look like. Right. Yeah. And, and I think in that way, Ecclesiastes is for me, it's one of the most relevant books in the Old Testament. And it's one that everybody skips over because it's got this like bleakness, this hopelessness, right? Of like, here's the character is kind of framed as Solomon he's rich he's wise he's richer than everybody he's more powerful than everybody and his point is it's all hobble right it's just like hobble it's stuff that you breathe out it's the waste yeah it goes away you can't control it you can't control for outcomes I'm gonna die just like you're gonna die right that's that's kind of a bleak book but I, I love what Adam Miller says about Ecclesiastes he says as Paul insists in order to become Christian, we must first learn to be hopeless. That's a little strange, but stick with me. <laughs> Hopelessness is the door to Zion. Hopelessness is crucial to a consecrated life. 
before we can find hope in Christ, we must give up hope in everything else. And I think there's the power of Ecclesiastes is it isn't all of these things that promise gospel blessings without gospel living, right? Wealth, status, friends, success, all of these things that we think of as the happy life, those things promise gospel blessings without gospel living, right? And and what what Adam Miller's saying, and, and I think he's, he's bringing out what Paul says, is you you have to leave aside all of that hope in false idols essentially and really train your hope on christ and that's christian hope it's not christian hope is standing in the place of my desire to be wealthy and happy and rich and and, and loved it's a different type of thing he says uh abraham paul claims learned how to trust god by learning how to hope against hope here's abraham he's old in age he's got this promise he would be stupid to believe it <laughs> but in his hopelessness he's still hoping and he says abraham against hope believed in hope or as joseph spencer more clearly renders it abraham was hopeless but hoping right and, and that's an interesting construction hopeless i know that life is going to overwhelm me and yet i hope in christ yeah uh, hopeless but hoping most of us are hoping but hopeless right, right? we hope in all of these things that aren't actually going to deliver on us uh for us and but there's that there there's that flip recognize the harsh realities of this world and hope in christ and holding those two things together i think is what was, the re- what was the reference on that who, who uh, what book was that of his uh that's from the introduction of adam miller's book uh nothing new under the sun oh, and I know it that. It's a paraphrase of Ecclesiastes. Yeah. So he he paraphrases Ecclesiastes, and then he has another book called "Grace Is Not God's Backup Plan," that's a paraphrase of the Book of Romans, and they're kind of two parts of one whole. Right. He sees Ecclesiastes over here, and then uh, and then Romans here, and they're working together to to turn your heart. That's Christ. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so so with this type of information um, and and background, I mean, there there's way more we could talk about as far as like the literary structure and style of of both Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Um, but if I'm a teacher, I'm watching and I'm kind of listening to what we're saying. This is good information. Um, now, how do we approach how do we approach a week of this? Um, what I find interesting is, so we got to do, you got to do doctrinal mastery this week. It's it, Proverbs three is that's an absolute. And I will say, do you though? Let, let me, let me, let me challenge that. Do you? It's been, it's been the youth theme all year. You are correct. And if they went to FSY, they got a week of, they, they got inundated with, them. but only, but only those who went to FSY, not all of them did. And I will tell you. Um, in, in the work that I did in the summertime as a session director, uh, every day was Proverbs 3, right? Mm-hmm. And there was still more that could be talked about. But, but that's just the know the doctrine part of Proverbs 3. Uh, how, much, how much of that was practice? How much of them did they actually get to get into what that's going to look like? So, so, so don't skip Proverbs 3, doctrinal mastery. Um, but I, I, the idea that's formulating in my head, you just tell me how you would do this and, and if this is the way you do it. Um, I totally see Proverbs being a, a pretty active learning experience. Whether I actually have them create their own cat poster, like actually give them. I was going to have them go. I was going to have them create memes. Uh, or memes or whatever, but but th- they have to like go in there and find the nugget of truth that's all flowery and wise, and it really is an ethics and values book, and so it's it's prime for them to kind of see kind of some of these fluffy truths that are they're true. I mean, they're not wrong. Um, have a day where they're feeling that fluffiness, and then I almost feel like there'd be a day of feeling the reality of Ecclesiastes, like once they kind of see, okay, I'm, I can expect success as I live this faithful 
you know, this moral life. And then you take Ecclesiastes, which takes that success and then well, gives it its proper context. Right. On top of them. <laughs> right. And then and then probably a completely separate day where we talk the messiness of life, where but, but the, yeah, the morality of it. Go ahead. Let me walk you what I'm thinking. Remember uh, um, Elder Hathen's talk, Faith is Not Blind. Right. And he talks about the three phases of faith. That it starts simple, then it's complex, and then it's simple on the other side of complexity. Right. But I think if we're gonna if if we're gonna spend some time in the darkness of Hobble in Ecclesiastes, there there needs to be with the eye towards the other side of it. But that's that would be my third day. Yeah, that's and right? that's well that's how that's how Ecclesiastes ends, right? It's right. it is a there is a resolution. We don't want to dwell in the messiness and the darkness. We need we need to acknowledge the reality. Um, we had um, I had I had a, a young a young woman in in my in one of my classes this week. Um, she uh, she told me that that a, that a girl in her um, in her ward committed suicide this last week, mm. and she was really having a hard time with it, and she was really really struggling, and and we we were just kind of talking and. And she's just like, I don't, she's, she's normally a very positive person. This, this is Caitlin. Um, you know, I'm talking about Hawkins and, Oh, okay. You know, you know, you know that family, don't you? Yeah. Um, she's very, she's normally very positive. She's normally very upbeat. And so having these conflicting emotions of sadness and confusion and, and just, feeling just all sorts of ways she just like i don't know how i'm supposed to feel i don't know you know she was really worried about you know if i feel sad is she's like i'm really worried that if i feel sad and others feel sad that somebody else is going to feel like they need to do this too and and it was it was very important to stop her and 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 acknowledge and, and not only acknowledge but tell her that it was okay to feel that way it's you should like you're you're human you should feel devastation over a tragic loss and you we should feel we should feel sadness and you should feel all of these emotions but we shouldn't stay there that's that's the hope that's that's what what mason's saying right the hope the hope in hopelessness is just asked her a very simple follow-up question do you know where she is today she goes well yeah i know she's in heaven it's okay do you know who she's with well, she's with God. Okay. What do you think God is, is saying to her? What do you think God is doing with her, to her? And if we can imagine and think about this outcome as, man, it's terribly devastating and sad, and we're, we wish that she hadn't done that, except that we know where she is and who she's with, and we and we have a hope that God knows perfectly what's going to bless her to the point where when we see her again, she won't be that we'll, we'll have a better experience with it. And so uh, that that's the acknowledgement that we need to make at the end of this is the, the simplicity that comes on the other side of complexity that we have that hope again. Yeah. Um, you, uh, I'm going to quote Mason to Mason. Do you remember when you did that in service where we talked about the narrative form of a, of a lesson? Do you remember talking we, about that? Yeah, you got to kind of have that. I, I really see it. And it's the same thing as, as Elder Hafen's, you know, simplicity on the other side of complexity. It's if I were to take the book and I would I would put Proverbs down here as pretty simplistic. Like you look at it, it's moralistic. It's it's good advice. We recognize it's good advice. The things that Proverbs says. And then you get introduced to some complexity with maybe the, some of the, the reality and cynicism of, of Ecclesiastes. But then, but then on, on the, as you wrap it up, as you bring them back together, as if, if you had some kind of work product from your Proverbs day, and then the feelings from Ecclesiastes day, and then together you can say, now let's re-examine Proverbs again. And how is it still true with holding that Ecclesiastes is giving a reality still, how is Proverbs still true and how do we how do we approach those two things together? 
Yeah, I think that that's right. Thinking of the the week as a whole, and uh, and I think one way to to help that last discussion is actually bringing back the end of Job a little bit because they're all supposed to be in conversation with each other. Right. Uh, Job thirty eight. This conversation with the Lord that Job has. Right. He's he's had all the friends come and and they've all essentially done the proverbs thing. Right. 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 Like let me. We know this about the Lord. We know this about the Lord, right? And they're giving him the aphorisms. And Job's like, no, I know who I am. And that's not what's happening here. And so finally, Job accuses God. He goes to him and says, this isn't fair. And 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 I love the way that Job, the book of Job handles that. Uh, Job 38, 5, who laid the measures there? Or, you know, 38, 4. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Yeah. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Essentially, Job, I'm going to show you my wisdom, how complex everything is. And I see you. I see your pain. And I, I can't even begin to describe all that has gone into this moment. Right. But I see you trust in me. And that's actually where Job ends, is trusting again in God. Right. He doesn't have a clean and simple answer to life anymore, but he has, he has a new vision of who God is and why he can trust in him. And I, I remember from one of the books that the Givens wrote, um spoke about this this woman who just had a hard life she'd suffered abuse she'd suffer i mean just loss after loss after loss and uh and she shared with sister gibbons an experience that she had where she woke up and she saw the savior at the end of her bed and he was weeping and uh and all he said was i'm sorry for the pain in your life um now that's not canon and it's not, you know, the, a new a new book of scripture or anything like that. That's one person's experience with Jesus Christ and how they interpret it. But I think there's some tools here that we can use to equip our students. Sometimes religion, structured religion, can feel a little bit like the book of Proverbs, and our life can feel a little bit like the book of Ecclesiastes. So how do you reconcile those two things? Uh and I think it's bringing it right back to the wisdom and grandeur and glory and also the personal uh, ministry of Jesus Christ to us. Yeah. Yep. If, if Christ is not the resolution of those two things, right. you know, I think we miss, we miss the it's, grand point. How do you square the circle? Yeah. Right. There's a square. Life is a square and life is a circle. So how do you reconcile those two things? It's only in and through the atonement of Jesus Christ that that happens. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, there's going to be dissonance between the rule, right? We, we tell our kids from the very earliest age that if you keep the commandments, you'll be happy. And then there's dissonance when kids get old enough to recognize, well, but they're not keeping the commandments. They look pretty happy. Mm -hmm. So why should I keep the commandments? And, and some of them actively choose to, to trust and keep keeping the commandments. And others say, I, I don't see any difference between them and us and our happiness. And, and you're actually making me, making me feel like I need to give up stuff. And so they do go live that lifestyle. And, they, and then they realize through very hard experiences why the, why the, the commandments. And, and some return and some get very bitter and don't. But there is, that, there is a dissonance that the, only the Savior um i i think it's um i in the in the world of of my truth and and my path and my journey and you know the all of the groups that that are trying to disassociate themselves with an organized religious tradition there's you know i can find god in the mountains and i can find god here and i can find sure except the savior the Savior himself said that I, I am the way to the Father, like I am the way. And so what if we thought about it in terms of 
all right, there's a lot of different ways to find Christ. But then when we find Christ, then it's very, it's very prescriptive, very specific. And, and it's not, and it's not trying to fit a bunch of square pegs in a round hole. It is shaving off our imperfect edges so that we're more like him. Because the more we look like him, then yeah, we are going to look a little more uniform, but he's going to be the one that make, decides what, what edges need to be, need to be ground down and which ones are okay to keep. He's the one that knows us. He's the one that is the perfect judge and all of that. Um, that's that's where the reconciliation is. That we have enough trust in, in him that um, when we find him, he's going to guide us to the Father. And, and I think right right there in that in that like concern, right? These guys are breaking the commandments. They look like they're having a good time. Why should I choose this and this? We could reframe that and say. Okay, let me reframe your question. You're you're asking why should I love the Savior more than I love these things, right? That's the question he asks like, Peter. Love and stop me more than these things, right? Why should I love the Savior more than these things if those things seem to be delivering happiness or entertainment or whatever? Yeah. And and John says we love him because he loved us first, right? Right, and. And so we can, this week, we can reframe our, our students' understanding a little bit on the the motivations for keeping the commandments, the motivations for, it's not, if you're going to approach the gospel as a mechanism for producing health, wealth, and happiness, or, you know, entertainment, like, you read the scriptures, you don't make it the scriptures unless you had a hard life. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, the best people at scriptures have a hard life. Jesus Christ has a hard life. So what is what is the motivation that we're going to tap into yeah. that's going to see us through life's complexities? It has to be love. And and the only appropriate response to the type of love that the Savior gives us is love. And, and, and there's ways that we express that. He's given us commandments. And All right. So before we make this a little bit longer of a video, really quickly, do we have any like warnings? Any any kind of uh, pitfalls to avoid for our teachers as they prepare to teach these? Uh, I would not. I mean, I would not treat, especially the book of Proverbs. I would not just say, hey, let's look at this Proverbs and this Proverbs and this Proverbs and go down the list. I would not just <laughs> hit them with just an overwhelming amount of one-liners just because there's nothing that's going to sink in there right it's, just well, it's not substantive either there's, there's yeah those are spiritual would, twinkies so i would not do that i would pick my shot on that um this is not a beginning to end book right right yeah but, yeah yeah don't, don't don't worry about coverage on this one right no. you know but Brian, I mean, what, what, give give us well, a warning I, I was just gonna say i think the other the other warning is let's not dwell on the negative let's acknowledge its existence but but again, the quicker the quicker that we can turn to the hope in Christ, the the better we'll we'll be. Like, let's acknowledge the messiness and let's be okay with the fact that it's messy. But you know, part of part of what we're trying to do is relevance, belonging, and but conversion. It's it's got to come back to the Savior. Yeah. And so, while it might be tempting to just get into a "woe is me" session of let's tell all our our negative stories and let's commiserate with each other, um, let's try to let's try to turn that around again where. Where okay, so yeah, I'm having a really rough time, but boy, living according to this prop, this proverbial truth, is what helped me get back out. Yeah, like there is a reason the proverb is the rule, even though exceptions exist all over the place. Yeah, and I think my warning is similar to uh, that, except it's more if if we look at proverbs and and Christ is not at the center of how uh, blessings in life come about. Um, it's just ethics. ethics, it's, ethics it's ethics right. and that it's just ethics. Okay. It's a study in ethics, which is what happens anytime you take gospel truths and you take the savior out of it. So right. um that's so, a bit of die turning priests. Are we saved by the law? Right. And the priests are saying yes. And the Benadi is like the world, the world would say dead. we are saved by right. just by just ethics. living a good life and being a good person. Right, right. All right. Groovy.